I'm going to go back to this problem that I talked about in the last video, which was x squared plus 7x plus 12. And we found out that in factored form it was x plus 3, x plus 4. But let's say I wanted to use my graphing calculator to help me out. If you graph this in the graphing calculator under y1 equals, and then hit graph, I want you to notice that the, the graph hits the x-axis, these are called the zeros, at negative 3 and at negative 4. Now they're awfully close to each other, but you'll see it. If you're not sure that's where it hits the x-axis, if you go to the table, which is second graph, you'll notice that the y component of both of these x values is 0. The 0, or x-intercept, of a function is where the graph hits the x-axis, in which case the y-coordinate is 0. Well, if I work backwards and I set both of these equal to 0, what I've just found are my binomial factors. Now I could do the exact same thing for problem 8, which was, let's see, 6x squared plus 7x minus 5. I would graph it in y1 equals, and then I would hit graph. Now, what you're going to notice is that it looks like the graph hits the x-axis at about 1 half. And then the other one, eh, maybe hard to tell. So if you look at the graph, I'm going to tell you another way of finding this. You'll notice that one of the places the graph hits is between 0 and 1. So if you go to second trace, this is called the calculate function. Number 2 says 0. Hit enter on number 2. And then down at the bottom of the screen, it says left bound question mark. Type in 0 for the left bound and hit enter. Now it says right bound question mark. Type in 1 and hit enter. Then it says guess question mark. Hit enter again. And then the graph says x equals 0.5, y equals 0. Well, 0.5 is 1 half. The other place where the graph is hitting the x-axis is between uh, 2, no, negative 2 and negative 3. So if you go back to second trace, number 2, 0, this is actually your left bound, isn't it? because it's further to the left on the number line. So when it says left bound, type in negative 3, enter. This would be your right bound, so type in negative 2, enter. And hit enter a third time. And it tells you that it's 1.666, however many sixes it, 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 it can put on the screen. Well, what's 0.6 repeating? Isn't that 2 thirds? And 1 and 2 thirds is 5 thirds. Actually, it said negative. Sorry about that. So, my two answers are 1 half and negative 5 thirds. So, if I work backwards, I get x minus a half equals 0. And I get x plus 5 thirds equals 0. I don't like fractions, so I like to rewrite that as 2x minus 1. Wait a second, all I did was take that, ex that denominator and write it in front of the x? That's a neat little trick. And then this one becomes 3x plus 5. And weren't those my binomial factors when I was done with the problem? They sure were. This is the hard part of factoring, is recognizing the form of an expression. Like I said before, Factoring tends to be difficult because students look at a problem and they're like, I don't know what method to use. That's difficult. That really just comes with practice. So in example 9a, 
I hope that at this point in time you could recognize that as a general trinomial where you want to look for two numbers that multiply to give you negative 3 and add to give you negative 2. Remember, you don't have a lot of choices because those are the only pairs of numbers that multiply to give you negative 3. This is the pair that gives you negative 2. So the factor form must be x plus 1, x minus 3. B, they try to trick you. I want you to notice that this is really just x squared minus 2x minus 3, where x is 5a plus 1. Wait a second. That, that's the previous problem. It's x plus 1x minus 3. But in place of x, you need to put 5a plus 1. Here's where I substituted back in for x, and then I can do a little simplifying. It's 5a plus 2, 5a minus 2, and that's your answer. The special factoring formulas are really just the reverse of the special product formulas that we talked about earlier. Sorry if you keep hearing my pen clink my coffee mug. So. If you have something of the form a squared minus b squared, it factors into a plus b a minus b. And it doesn't matter which direction you write it in. If you want to write it as a minus b, then a plus b makes no difference. If you have something of the form a squared plus 2ab plus b squared, these have a special name. They're actually called perfect square trinomials. And they're very important when we talk about conic sections. Perfect square trinomials always factor into either a plus b squared or a minus b squared. A perfect square trinomial is the one where the last term and the first term are perfect squares. That means something times itself. And the middle term is always 2 times the square root of the first term times the square root of the last term. Whether you put a plus or a minus sign depends on, well, what's in the middle. If it's a plus sign, you put a plus. If it's a minus sign, you put a minus. The last two are the sum and difference of cubes. And you may or may not have run across that in your honors class last year. It probably depends on who you had. This will come back to haunt you, however, in my class. So a cubed plus b cubed. First, I would take the cube root of each of those terms. Then you would write a cubed plus b cubed in the form a plus b, a squared minus a b plus b squared. And if it's the difference of two cubes, first find the cube root of each term and then write a minus b, a squared plus a b plus b squared. So we're going to factor differences of squares. Now, this is in the form a squared minus b squared, where a is 2x and b is 5. Because when you have squares, to find a and b, you have to take the square root of each term. So this would be 2x plus 5, 2x minus 5 in factored form. a in part b would be x plus y, and b would be z. So in factored form, it would be x plus y plus z, x plus y minus z. That would be factored form. Now let's look at factoring the differences in sums of cubes. 27x cubed minus 1 is a difference of two cubes. The cube root of the first term is going to be 3x, because 27 is 3 times 3 times 3. The cube root of the second term is 1. So in factored form, it's going to be a minus b, a squared plus a times b plus b squared. Now that one wasn't bad. It's the second one you may not recognize as a cube. 8 is easy, the cube root of 8 is 2. But what's the cube root of x to the 6? Well, x to the 6 is x squared times x squared times x squared. So a is x squared, b is 2. 
Since it's a sum, it's going to be a plus b, a squared, a squared times, now remember, x squared times x squared, that's what a squared is, that's why it's x to the fourth, minus ab plus b squared. Recognizing perfect squares. Perfect square trinomials are very easy to factor if you can identify them. How do you know a perfect square trinomial? Well, if the first and last term are perfect squares, and the middle term is 2 times the square root of the first term times the square root of the last term, then it's a perfect square trinomial. A perfect square trinomial factors into either a plus b squared or a minus b squared. Well, x squared plus 6x plus 9 is going to factor into a plus b squared. Now let's look at b. Perfect square, perfect square, is this 2 times the square root of the first term times the square root of the last term? Absolutely it is except this is going to factor into a minus b squared. Factoring an expression completely is where there are multiple factoring techniques going on in one problem, so you have to be careful. For example, in part a, 2x to the fourth minus 8x squared. I mentioned earlier that the first thing that I would always look for is that greatest common factor. And it turns out that both of those terms can be evenly divided by 2x squared. So when you take out a 2x squared, you're left with x squared minus 4. But now this expression is a squared minus b squared, which we said factors into a plus b, a minus b. In this case, it's x plus 2, x minus 2. So factoring completely could mean a greatest common factor plus one of the special factor techniques. In problem B, I want you to first look for the greatest common factor. Both terms share an x and a y squared. So when I take out an x and a y squared, I'm left with x to the fourth minus y to the fourth. Now this, I claim to you, is in the format a squared minus b squared, where a just happens to be x squared, and b is y squared. So when you factor that, you get x squared plus y squared, x squared minus y squared. But wait, there's more. This x squared minus y squared is also in the form a squared minus b squared. So it can be factored even more into x plus y, x minus y. So factoring completely usually means you have to be careful if there are multiple factoring techniques going on in one problem. This is a problem you have not run across before. And I'm showing it to you anyway because one of the things that always irks me is when students ask me the question, when am I ever going to use this? Well, you may never use the technique I'm about to use to factor this expression. But that's not the point. The point is to learn new ways of solving problems or learning to overcome adversity when you don't know how to do something. How do you figure out how to do it? How do you get the right answer? So think about this problem in terms of I need to learn something new and I can do it and not in the sense of when am I ever going to use this again? Because you're not going to use this particular process again. You have never dealt with factoring an expression with rational exponents. Very easy to do, though. You're going to factor out the term with the smallest exponent. Now, remember how you determine if numbers are big or small. This is going to be the term with the smallest exponent, because negative one-half is smaller than everything else. Remember that factoring is a fancy word for divide. So literally what I'm doing is I'm dividing everything by 6. Actually, I shouldn't divide everything by 6. Let's go back here for a second. 
if I look at the numbers, the greatest common factor is actually going to be 3. And then I'm going to divide everything by the x with the smallest exponent. So I'm actually going to divide everything by 3x to the negative 1 half power. Now, how do I simplify these division problems? Well, these were the problems where you subtracted the exponents. So x to the 3 halves divided by x to the negative 1 half is x to the 3 halves minus negative 1 half which is 3 halves plus 1 half, which is 4 halves, which is 2, minus 9 divided by 3 is 3. x to the 1 half over x to the negative 1 half is x to the 1 half minus negative 1 half, which is 1 half plus 1 half, which is 2 halves, which is 1, plus 6 divided by 3 is 2, and x to the negative 1 half divided by itself is 1 went away. And look, now I don't have a bunch of expressions that have x's with fractional exponents. However, x squared minus 3x plus 2 is a general run-of-the-mill trinomial. The two numbers that multiply to give you 2 but add to give you negative 3 are negative 1 and negative 2. We're going to try that one more time. 2 plus x to the negative 2 thirds x plus 2 plus x to the 1 third. The problem that's in the chapter 1 test is like this first problem. It's not like problem B, but because we like to learn new things, the greatest common factor that I'm going to divide out of both of these terms is going to be 2 plus x to the negative 2 thirds. I pick the one with the smallest exponent, and negative 2 thirds is smaller than 1 third. So now when I divide each of those terms by 2 plus x to the negative 2 thirds, the first term becomes 1x, and the second term becomes 2 plus x to the 1 third minus negative 2 thirds, which is going to be 1 third plus 2 thirds, which is going to be 4 thirds. 3 thirds, sorry, 3 thirds, and 3 thirds is 1. Wait a second, now I have an expression that's just x plus 2 plus x, that's just 2x plus 2, with a 2 plus x to the negative 2 thirds in front. The last thing that I want you to notice is that this part of the expression has a greatest common factor, and that greatest common factor is 2. So you could factor out a 2 and just write it out in front of the whole shebang, and then that would actually be your final answer. The last technique of factoring is called factor by grouping, and I actually used factor by grouping earlier in a problem where we were factoring a trinomial of the form ax squared plus bx plus c. Factor by grouping happens when you group the first two terms and the, sec and the last two terms, and then you factor the greatest common factor out of each of those groups. So the first group has a greatest common factor of x squared, and then you're left with x plus 1. <sighs> Sorry. Um, the, the greatest common factor in the second binomial, 4x plus 4, is 4. And when I factor it out, I'm left with x plus 1. Wait a second. Both of these have an x plus 1. If I take it away from both of those, I'm left with x squared plus 4. In problem B, though, you have to be careful. Watch what I do. Remember that minus 3x is the same as plus negative 3x. You still need a plus sign between your two groups, so I just made the 3x negative. So now when I go and factor the greatest common factor out of the first group, the greatest common factor is x squared, and I'm left with x minus 2. I want the second group to have an x minus 2 left over, so in order to do that, I'm going to factor out negative 3. The reason I do that is because it changes the sign of the second term. Because when I divide these both by negative 3, the first term becomes positive, and the second term becomes negative. And now both of these share an x minus 2, and when I take out the x minus 2, I'm left with x squared minus 3. And that is factor by grouping. And that is the end of algebraic expressions.